I want to welcome everybody. My name is Lori Taylor. I'm the campaign manager for Weston for Congress. And thank you for joining us for this policy lunch with Kale Weston. Today, Kale is going to be talking about issues of civil rights and social justice. So many important issues fall under this broad topic. I know we won't cover every topic. So I want to direct you to the extensive statements on social justice issues and policy on our website. You can go to westonforcongress.com and look for issues in the navigation and then go to social justice. And personally, when I read these statements, I know that my time is well spent working to send Kay Weston to Congress to represent Utah's second district. I feel deeply moved by the commitments of this campaign to social justice. Uh, please be thinking of questions to ask during the Q&A, especially if your questions aren't answered on the website. Kale likes to be stretched and he's open to big discussions about difficult issues, so ask him. Uh, now the tech. Please stand mute while Kale speaks. Use the chat feature to ask questions during the remarks. Our communications director, Julie Bartell, will gather your questions and you can control how your screen looks. Near the top right of your screen, you can choose either a grid view, it's a three by three grid that gives you the full Brady Bunch experience or speaker view to enlarge the video of the current speaker. And finally, if you saw Kale's Hinckley Institute interview on Monday, you know that network issues interrupted the sound. We're going to end a little bit early today at 1.20 to give Kale time to get to the Hinckley Institute to re-record his interview. So let's get started. Please ask your questions in chat to Julie and we'll answer as many as possible. Kale? Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Julie. Uh, I always want to say thank you to our team that makes this possible. We've got a great um, bunch of volunteers. I just sent a note out to everyone. I hope many of you are on uh, today's session, but Tyson, who worked on a, a key paper that I'll be referring to, and Wes as well, uh, uh, so I want to say thank you, especially uh, to both of them, as well as Shane and Gwen, who got this started from the get-go, and John Thomas, I hope you're doing well if you're on. Um, but all of you who are spending about 40, 45 minutes with us, as, as Lori said, I think, you know, at the beginning, and this is our fifth policy um, launch, and we've got two more to go, uh, I think I've said before, we don't want to run a safe campaign. We want to run a campaign that is proportionate to the stakes this year. And I think this is one area where uh, that's as, as true as, as anything, given uh, I think what we're gonna have the chance to discuss today. And it's really gonna flow from the kinds of questions you have. So, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, this episode of following Stewart on his town halls and, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance that was very much part of how he wanted to begin uh, every town hall. And, you know, we th do we think enough about the word indivisible? Do we think enough about what uh, liberty and justice for all really means? And if there's a couple of words that I like to get back to, whether it's healthcare, um, whether it's some of these uh, policy failures in Washington, is that we aren't for all, we're still for some. Um, and until we get to for all, that's a failing and that's a failure and it, and it hurts real people. So with that kind of as the frame, um, I wanted to start in the 10 or 12 minutes I've got to look at police reform and the Black Lives Matter uh, issue. Of course, a lot happened after uh, George Floyd was killed, but, but it's important to remember, and we've got a member of our team who, who helped me understand this, Ty, about in, is incidents and issues that are coming up all the time now about other cases that seem to have not gotten the attention that they deserved. So I wanna start with something local, um, uh, what's going on maybe here in Salt Lake City um, we've got cases here, we've got leadership here with our, our current mayor uh, that I think speaks well to some of these reforms. And then I'd like to take it maybe to the, the so what question at the federal level, uh, talking specifically about qualified immunity, which is really, I think, an important concept to understand and maybe some of the issues surrounding that and where certain pieces of legislation are, are stopped right now. And of course, it doesn't take uh, any of us to guess too much that it's blocked because of uh, who controls the Senate right now. Then briefly, I want to maybe in the second section talk a little bit about um, voting rights. Uh, we probably won't have as much time to go into that. 
Uh, there's a bill now with John Lewis's name on it that I think is quite important. It too uh, has been stopped in the Senate. Uh, move maybe to LGBTQ and fairness for all. There's some really good, I think, information and due to a lot of work from Shane and, 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 and Julian Laurie and others uh, on where we're very different than the fairness uh, for all concept or bill that Chris Stewart wants to put forward. And then I thought in the last few minutes, I would extend it from local, national to international. <clears throat> That's kind of how I'm wired. Sometimes I do it in the reverse order, but uh, Wes did a, a member of our team did a very good paper on Guantanamo. And I think it is important um, to think about how our values driven foreign policy has been lost and been corrupted really in the last four years. So we talked last week in more detail about that. But if you'll allow me, I think I will read part of my book in the end where I, I'm in a room in Eastern Afghanistan with former Guantanamo detainees. And sometimes when I'm asked, and I think I'll be asked again at Hinckley why I wrote the book I did, um, I titled one chapter, Life After Guantanamo. So I think that's how we'll end it and then really open it up to you for, the, for, the, for most of the meeting. <clears throat> All right, so let's start locally here in 84101 or so. Um, if you didn't have the chance to, to read a Facebook post, and maybe, Julie, uh, you can let everyone see it when I talk about it. Lex Scott, who's the local head of, of Black Lives Matter in Utah, met with the head of the Fraternal Order of Police. And it's, you know, it's not a long read, and I just want to highlight part of it. Um, but there were certain pieces of what he wrote on September 10th, which is not that long ago, I think that are, are powerful and important and in his own words. So he said, you know, I met with the president of the Fraternal Order of Police this morning. I would like to write about a, that experience. He talks about how it came about. And then he said, one of the main points he wanted to get across is we are not enemies. This has to stop. There's a perception out there that we hate the police. We do not. We hate police brutality. We hate murder. We want checks and balances put into place that will give us accountability and transparency in policing. Of course, that's everything we stand for as well. So he talked about going into the office and actually meeting in person. And he said, although he'd been studying police reform for seven years, he had never met with the Fraternal Order of Police. So again, to take it to our campaign, I'm a big believer in conversations. I'm even a bigger believer in the art of listening. And listening is hard to do. Talking is easy, talking is, talking is cheap. And as I've said before, political talk is the cheapest talk of all. So as he goes into what was covered in that meeting, um, I think it's, it's quite important because again, it's a local example of, I think, some bridge building. It's again, one of the big differences between me and Mr. Stewart. He's all about walls, he's all about division. I truly am uh, instinctively a bridge builder. And I think our team reflects that as well. So he talked about what it means to have a proper critical res response team. He went into some local examples in Salt Lake that I, I think we're all aware of. And Ginger, if you're on the call, thank you for highlighting um, the, teen the teenager who, of course, had some um, <coughs> serious mental health challenges and, and was shot several times. And we've all probably seen the video of his mother highlighting how it didn't need to probably happen that way. Uh, he also talked about one of the, the ideas that he had long uh, proposed and it was for police officers to have rubber bullet guns in their cars, which I hadn't really um, thought about before and explains that a little bit. And then it kind of goes into what is a racial bias and what does it mean um, to not maybe have a sense of, if you're on the other side, how it feels uh, to be the minority and maybe a, a community that doesn't have um, a large percentage of, 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 of minority populations. But what I want to end with is kind of the hopeful note, because I think today there's so much negativity and there is real reason to be concerned across our country. But as I read this, it really left me thinking if, if this is possible between the local Fraternal Order of Police and our, our local Black Lives Matter leader, there's hope. And he said, this is going to be on their podcast and which I have listened to on, on other topics, but he said, this may be the most powerful thing that I've ever done. So. Why start there? I think it's because at the most local level, you're seeing people reaching out, listening and trying to understand. Let's then take it to, of course, what does a mayor do in this case? And I think, you know, Mayor Mendenhall has been quite active. And sometimes when you take tough stands, it comes at a price and I don't need to repeat the headlines, but she's uh, been criticized by um, some of the police and some are saying they're leaving because of some of these changes. So, 
what about the federal level? I want to shift now to um, the paper that Tyson put together. And I had, I had known a bit about qualified immunity, and it came up actually down in Kane County, particularly when Chris Stewart was asked by some very uh, attentive and, and um, vocal uh, voters down there. It was quite amazing to see um, that interaction. And it, one of the conversations started with qualified immunity. Uh, so again, if I were at the U or at Westminster or at Marine Corps University, I'd say, okay, class, what do we think qualified immunity is? I think we have a sense of what immunity writ large is, but why is it qualified? So I just want to spend a couple of minutes, uh, maybe one minute talking about what that means and maybe some of the legislation that is surrounding that question and where we Democrats have a different position uh, than, than most of the Republicans. So qualified immunity was actually, uh, uh, it's Supreme Court, it has a basis in the Supreme Court, and I won't go into all the background, but Early on when uh, the federal government was trying to come in and beat back the KKK and the post-Civil War period, it's an example of where for people who say states' rights are everything, that's not true when it comes to social justice and civil rights. The federal government, as students of history all know, has come in and said, this is not acceptable. We're actually going to improve the situation because that's the right thing to do. So in a recent ruling um, that actually upheld qualified immunity, Justice Sotomayor um, wrote this, which is qualified immunity doctrine turned into quote, has turned into an absolute shield for law enforcement officers. It tells officers that they can shoot first and think later. And it tells the public that palpably unreasonable conduct will go unpunished. Um, and it wasn't just Justice Sotomayor um, that seemed to have, a, and it, uh, Thomas actually had an interesting take on, on qualified immunity as well, if you're interested. So this was a Supreme Court decision, and in less than until the Supreme Court uh, modifies it or reformulates it or reverses it, it's, it's precedent. There's another uh, route, of course, which is the job I'm running for, which is would an act of Congress and legislation get into qualified immunity? And in the last few months, there's actually been movement in that direction. Of course, it's been led by Democrats and been stopped uh, in the Senate. So the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, in, and Stewart voted no on that, unsurprisingly, was passed. And it's now, um, there's been no action in uh, Mitch McConnell's controlled Senate. Um, there was strong opposition by police unions to that uh, change, which would have um, put in a lot more fine print about uh, qualified immunity. And then... Helpfully, I think it's important we know, well, where's the president, uh, hopefully, to be Joe Biden on this question and, the, and our party platform. And the language in the Democratic Party platform on qualified immunity is reining it in. It does not say to eliminate it. Um, Tyson, who had written this at the end, uh, said my background in international relations and as a State Department uh, rep, would probably want me to speak to how, if we're preaching some of these things at home, how are we practicing or advocating them so that we can be persuasive overseas? And that's where I'll end uh, with part of my book and, and what it means when we say we stand for these values and principles, but we actually are not uh, doing much about it. So qualified immunity, Black Lives Matter and police reform. I didn't quite want to get into as much on the defunding of the police. I think if you want to have a conversation about that, I do think it's important because it's become a, a, a word that the Republicans want to hang around every Democratic candidate. And we've seen some of the commercials where uh, an elderly person's in their home and there's a burglar crawling around outside and they pick up the phone and you know it says it'll be four days before the police arrive at your front door. Whether we believe or not that's effective, um, if you look at Chris Stewart's latest messaging, uh, he is running on law and order. He's going to be running on the fear and division, the only messages they have. And I think I'm capable and prepared to speak to what defunding really means is reallocation of resources. It's if the police are fully funded, but mental health uh, crisis support teams, um, social services are not, that's where the problem really is. Um, but it is a word, I think, that the Republican Party believes they can uh, scare people with. And I think we, we just need to acknowledge that and, and, and remember it and then push back on that. So quickly to voting rights, I wish we had more time. 
Um, but the, the John Lewis bill is worth looking at because what I think is going on there is important, which is Congress is trying to say uh, when the Supreme Court uh, weakened the Voting Rights Act, they're going to try and come in and, and actually make certain states, and they tended to be southern states, uh, get away with things that nationally, under the Voting Rights Act, under the original interpretation, they were not able to. So follow that if you're interested in, in what might happen, particularly if we can turn the Senate. Um, section three, um, the fairness for all debate. We've got a lot of good material um, on, our, on our website about that. Um, I think if you go into that, you'll see that um, in a state like Utah with a strong religious influence, um, sometimes I'm asked, you know, about the separation between church and state or the public sphere and the private sphere. Um, and we have a section on our website that, that gets into that. And I hope you'll also spend some time on that. In no way am I anti any religion, um, but I also am a big believer in that principle of non-establishment and the free exercise of. So if you look at what, what that bill was trying to do, it was trying to carve out some exceptions that would I think have crossed over into what uh, truly is constitutional. Finally, um, I did want to read a few statistics that I came across um, that are important, I think, as far as how much violence is out there, how much of these protests, um, and where, where is it happening. And there was a, a good, uh, I think it was a Vox article that Shane pointed me to. So I just want to kind of give a couple of data points about what this Princeton University affiliated group had found. And then I'll, I'll conclude with uh, the Guantanamo on the international level of of rights. So a new report from the Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project in collaboration with Princeton University's Bridging Divides Initiative identified 7,750 Black Lives Matter protests from May 26th through August 22nd at 2,400 locations across the U.S. An examination of these events found that 93% of them remained peaceful, 93% peaceful, while protests at about 220 locations turned violent which is defined as the destruction of property, including clashes between protesters and police and counter protesters. So we know how it's being politically wrapped by Mr. Stewart and the Republicans. So let's continue to look at some of the actual data points. Um, again, as a fact-based candidate and a fact-based campaign, I'm a big believer in getting to what's really going on. Counter protest activity is also on the rise, a trend that can quickly escalate the number of violent clashes according to the report. So between May 24th and August 22nd, over 360 counter protests were recorded around the country, accounting for nearly 5% of all demonstrations. Of these, 43 or nearly 12% turned violent with clashes between pro-police demonstrators and demonstrators associated with uh, Black Lives Matter, for example. In July alone, the report uh, re records over 160 counter protests or more than 8% of all demonstrations of these 18 turned violent. So that's again, just context, I think, for all of these issues. I think, unfortunately, we'll probably see more of it and we're definitely gonna see a campaign by my opponent to try and make people be afraid, uh, to be afraid that the police won't be there, that we Democrats are gonna take away the police from citizens and that we're all socialists. That's shorthand, but that's, that's all they've got. And if you follow the messaging coming out from uh, people like McCarthy um, and the people that Chris Stewart chooses to affiliate with. This is their message. This is their mantra. And I think we're going to hear more of it from Trump all the way down. Again, I think we've got a counter to that. I think when you talk about what defund means, there's a way to, to explain that. Um, but I think this is going to be one of the big messages they run on all the way through November 3rd because they're doing it already. Okay, I wanted to end uh, before we get to questions with uh, Guantanamo. And why, why should we care about an issue that seems like it's been a while uh, since people really thought about not only rights with inside our borders, but also the rights we believe extend to just by virtue of being a human being. Of course, this is very personal to me. I spent seven years in two wars uh, with the State Department. And one of the most important chapters of a long book is one I'm gonna read uh, from in conclusion. And guess what it's titled, Life After Guantanamo. Um, because I was working in the eastern part of the country where if we walk back to the uh, fall of 2001, right after September 11th, uh, most of the people that were sent to Guantanamo uh, came from the eastern side of Afghanistan. 
um, it was not Iraq. And I can get into the differences there. But interestingly, if you were a detainee in Iraq, you fell under the prisoner of war uh, legalities. If you were rounded up where I used to live for a year and a half, and Osama bin Laden once lived, you fell under this um, you know, different category that was very warped that could send you right from host province to Cuba. So the epigraph of the chapter, and I'm a big believer in finding the right quote for nonfiction chapters, is from Lord of the Flies, William Golding's classic, which is the world, that understandable and lawful world, was slipping away. I'm going to read now just a few parts of this chapter because I think what it does is it brings you into not only the room that I was in with these former Guantanamo detainees, but what what is their voice? What are the issues they raise? And as a good State Department guy, I considered my job to just be a reporter. Um, I only had a linguist with me. I didn't have any U.S. Army or military. I had no guards with me. And it was probably one of the most intense meetings I've ever had. And so if you want to speed read my book, uh, read this chapter read when senators and generals talk and read to Monument Valley. Those are our three good places to start. So here I'll just read a bit um, and then conclude. The Afghan who had formerly been held at Guantanamo, the final stop for many beyond Bagram, said he did not want to tell me his name. He opened our conversation with a cutting comment. Given where he had spent the last four years, it should not have surprised me, but it did. And this is his quote. Sometimes you Americans have ears and no eyes, or eyes and no ears. You do not want to see or hear certain things. Short, wiry, and skinny below a gaunt face, with long fingers topped by long fingernails, the Afghan, who would not share his name, sat across a small table in front of me. Already seeking control of the room, he looked as if he had much to say. And being fluent in English, he made sure nothing would be lost in translation during our meeting. His verbal fury dominated a session that lasted for two hours, but felt like a hundred, to the point I believed he might opt to use his fists as well. If he had lunged my way, I would not have blamed him. I wish Mullah Sardar could have been seated at my side, if only to run interference, perhaps even to vouch for me as if to declare, give my friendly American infidel here a chance. So I, I go more into what he's telling me, and he, he extends his kind of introduction by saying, um, by way of introduction, this agitated and aggressive Afghan said he had survived almost 50 straight months at, at the Guantanamo Bay prison, approximately 1,500 days in total. Quote, I was held from September 22nd, 2002 to October 16th, 2006. His anger still burned within even after receiving his get out of jail notification from prison officials in Cuba. I sat before him not only as the face of the official U.S. government representative in host province. In me, he also saw the face of his former American jailers. And to him, it would forever be an ugly one masking unforgivable treatment. In a small way in the small room on the easternmost edge of Afghanistan, I was hoping the gap between jailer and jailed might close even if just a bit. Guantanamo had damaged, numer had damaged numerous lives and represented a major crack in U.S. mirror what the United States believed it represented to the world versus what the nation I represented meant in the eyes of non-Americans. I'll conclude with a few more, a couple more paragraphs. Um, once writers start to read their own books, it's dangerous territory. Um, the former detainee, de detainees did not hold back. Starting off with a litany of complaints and accusations based on US conduct from the time they were first detained. One described telling American soldiers, quote, we are not afraid of handcuffs. You can take our names. He said he got the handcuffs, but quote, you Americans waited a long time before asking my name. After being moved to a facility, he described his new conditions, quote, I got sick, fungus on my head. They did give me medicine, but it did not work. They gave us one blanket, but it was freezing anyway. The room was like ice. We were fed bread and cauliflower. We had a choice to either eat or pray. The youngest of the former detainees interjected in a soft voice. They said, we will release you if you help us find terrorists. I told them I was 16 years old and a shopkeeper. My family thought I was dead. He went on to say, your military dropped bombs on my home, killed 12 elders, women and children. It happened in Nader Shakat. Acting as a spokesman of sort, for, of sort for them by now, he said that upon release, he had been blindfolded and quote, locked to a metal chair as he was transported from Cuba to Kabul, at which point he was given about 1,500 Afghani, which is about $30. He eventually made his way back to host. 
so at the very end of this chapter, and I'll fast forward uh, for real, uh, I asked these former detainees, um, well, I'll just read it. Before the day's meeting ended, I asked the former detainees what documents any US official or military officer had given them upon release from Guantanamo. Each had spent between three and five years in prison. They mentioned a piece of paper as the only one handed over upon being flown from Cuba to Kabul. I asked if I could get a copy. A few days later, Arif, my linguist, received the release document from one of the Afghans. Mr. Kale, here's what he gave me, just this. My eyes quickly scanned it, just this. You've got to be kidding. Are you sure he didn't say there were more documents, anything else, nothing? He looked nervous and wanted to leave. I held in my hands the only documentation issued by the US government or any military officer following a former detainee's transfer back to Afghanistan. It was titled Unclassified, and this is what, how it read. Notification of the decision of an administrative review board. And then there's some digits, quote, to depart Guantanamo Bay. These are the only words that the US government has ever given an Afghan after spending four to six to eight years in Cuba. Listen closely. An administrative review board, very Orwellian, has reviewed the information about you that was talked about at the meeting on 2 December 2005. And the deciding official in the United States has made a decision about what will happen to you. You will be sent to the country of Afghanistan. Your departure will occur as soon as possible. So that is how we ran our get out of jail card for the Afghans. So at the end of this chapter, I say nothing else, no other explanation, just 70 words and poor Pentagon prose at that. The single piece of paper would mean more American troop deaths, more Taliban recruits. Not only was I convinced of this point, so was Governor Jamal, who was a close friend of mine. He had already warned me. And more suicide bombers plotting away and heading our way. Well, of course, the next chapter talks about what happens when you're in a convoy and a suicide bomber tries to kill you. So I wanted to end with the international um, angle because I think it's also part of when we talk about civil rights and rights, which is the United States at our best, and we should thank Eleanor Roosevelt from the get-go, stood for a lot of these values. And I'm going to tell one final story before we open it up in the last 20 minutes to questions, which is when I had left our mission in New York City, where I worked Al-Qaeda Taliban sanctions and, and Iraqi issues. Um, I was in Baghdad uh, working for the Coalition Provisional Authority. Uh, with a lot of the truckers at the time. And I got emails from Washington saying, hey, we just got voted off the Human Rights Commission. How did that happen? How did the Americans get booted out of this fundamental body that we helped establish? And this was under the George W. Bush administration. And even at that time, we were having some friction with the international community, but that is nothing compared to what's happening today. So back to the question of what we, what we do at home through pieces of legislation and then how do we represent these values and these rights around the world. I think it's, it's very much uh, in sync or out of sync. And of course right now, uh, we're not even paying attention to what's happening in our own neighborhoods as much as we should. And I can't imagine how hard it is for my colleagues in the State Department, my former colleagues to be representing these values uh, internationally. We talked last week about the Saudi connections. We talked about Khashoggi. Um, but if rights don't mean anything in our own neighborhoods, in our own cities, or there's still a gap there, and an incredible division instigated by people like Chris Stewart, I worry about what's going on in a lot of parts of the world that um, we don't really hear about and we're not really paying attention to. So I'll leave it at that. I Sorry it took longer than I had planned, but I wish we had time to, to go into a bit more detail on some of the, the subjects that I, I highlighted. But Julie, Laurie, let's, um, Shane, let's hand it over to all of you. I have a quick question, if you can answer it quickly. What sure. should happen to prisoners still in Guantanamo now? We need to close it down. And I, you know, I'm on the record. Um, in fact, that Guantanamo letter, um, I'll tell you a secret. When I was in host Afghanistan, I got a, a call from a New York Times columnist. And he said, hey, Kale, what's going on in your part of the world? I said, well, I just got this incredible unclassified document from a Guantanamo detainee. And, and, and Roger Cohen put it in one of his columns. And I was proud that you know, it was unclassified. It wasn't a classified document. And, and at that point, you know, I used to argue to Holbrook and my chain of command in the, in the State Department that we need to shut this place down. Uh, by the time I got to Helmand, 
um, later on. Um, but it's not shut down because one of the challenges is when you take people like that for many years, uh, which governments, which countries are going to take them back. And so the Saudis had a very elaborate kind of come back to Saudi Arabia program. A lot of the other countries did not. And President Obama, to his credit, moved in that direction. But part of the legalities of the legal um, twilight zone that these people are in was eventually taken up um, by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually, and I think it's Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, made a very important decision about what legal due process rights do people have, even if they're off, um, off the con uh, outside our borders. Um, so we could probably get into that, but we need to close it down because the other part I write about is the Afghan law students. And they used to say to me, again, you Americans say you're for all these rights and, and legal processes. Then why do you just throw people in Cuba and say, trust us, we have all the information we need. A third level is there's been some of these former um, military uh, staff judge, judge advocates and judges that have written on the topic. And there's some pretty powerful writing about how they saw uh, the breakdown in Cuba. But I'm, I'm an advocate for shutting it down. I really want to follow up with other questions about that because we do have other questions, but I'm going to take it in, the, in another direction so that we can sure. cover a broader. So since we're talking about detention, Colby asks, what are some reasonable steps to ending the human rights violations, including new corroborated allegations of forced hysterectomies being carried out in ICE detainment camps? And how do we work toward closing those? Good question. I think, you know, to the credit of someone like Mayor Wilson locally, she's been to the border. I like when I see um, representatives who actually treat that job as a real job, not to go raise money and hang out and fancy dinner parties. And so we have had, I think, some good uh, leaders, elected officials go to the borders and, and put a spotlight on what's going on. Um, eventually, I think you're going to have to, uh, well, one, of course, you're not going to get those changes if we have the current administration around for another four years. Um, I think you're going to have to have probably a role of some international bodies. Um, there is a lot of the human rights dimension that I worked indirectly with when I was at our, when I was part of our delegation in New York at the, at the United Nations. And so there's some very helpful international organizations and, and, not, and NGOs, I think, that can bring scrutiny and, and, and attention to these issues. And, and from a no, more neutral, I would argue, point of view. And then finally, I would say, you know, let's give a credit to our media. Um, you know, at the end of my long war book, I thank these journalists who were telling the story while being shot at. Uh, tomorrow night, if you're interested, we're having an event with Rajiv Chandrasekharan, and he used to write for the Washington Post, and he made sure the stories got told uh, from those war zones, but we've got very good journalism, I think, that has come out of the camps. And as long as we as citizens care enough to read those stories and support those in newspapers and those media outlets, that's a, a good way of holding any administration accountable. Okay. I'm going to keep giving us a broad view if possible. Could I just, one, one term I wanted to go back to on, sure. on Cuba and Guantanamo, is if you're interested, there was this legal definition that our government put forward, as well as this torture redefinition of enhanced interrogation techniques, EIT, but it was also unlawful enemy combatants. So enhanced interrogation techniques was how torture was redefined. And they literally got into the gory details of what, what torture really means in terms of things being done to your physical body, let alone mental uh, state. And then unlawful enemy combatants is how our government at its worst started to warp the legalities around the politics of war. So if you were detained in, in Iraq when I was there, you were not an unlawful enemy combatant. You were a prisoner of war. You had a different legal cat categorization. And so most of those Guantanamo detainees were rolled up in that initial period after September 11th. And I remember talking to a sailor, a Delta operator, uh, when I was a lot younger, and I just said, did, did we take money for this information? And he said, sir, I'm not going to answer that question. So there was a financial incentive, of course, to point fingers at people. Um, okay. I'm going to take you in a completely different direction. Sure. Yep. What's your stance on rolling back transgender participation in the military? Oh, I, 
you know, I've got another chapter in my book that's not specific to transgender, but it's Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And it's another one of the most important chapters of my book because I was over there when um, President Obama was basically saying we're going to, you know, change that policy. So I, uh, I, I shouldn't tell you this, but back when General Dunford and Jim Mattis used to run the Pentagon, I usually didn't behave very well. And if issues came up, I would say, what the hell, you know, <laughs> like, come on, you guys are running the Pentagon. And, and I think they, they, they were trying to do the right thing. Um, but on that one, it's wrong. And there's been a failure, I think, of, of political will um, to say to Trump, you're not, the, the uniform leadership do not want to be focused on this. The politicians that have their uh, single issues or think it's popular in some weird way for their constituents will we'll, 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 we'll try and get these divisive issues. Um, but I, I, if I were in Congress, I would uh, try and make sure that the Pentagon does what a Pentagon should do, which is if anyone wants to serve their country and get shot at in that process, they should let them do that and not kick them out for any adjective or reason. Um, and I've written about that. I wrote about it specifically on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Um, but when the transgender policy came forward, General Dunford was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And, and I'd know him from <laughs> Ramadi era. He's no longer in government. But uh, it's taking the right stand. And I think the politics in our country has shifted uh, that if we can uh, get Biden back in and get a decent secretary of defense in, we can repair a lot of that damage. Okay. Let's bring it back to our cities, specifically Salt Lake City. Yep. Do you have ideas on how to prevent the continued shooting by police of individuals with disabilities, mostly autism, not only shooting, but totally uninformed on what autism is and how to deal with an individual with autism. One, this is, uh, uh, there's more to it. I'm going to just yeah. read the whole thing. There's, this is a scary scenario for parents with children with autism. Utah has the third highest rate with one in 58 children being diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. I'm one of those parents and I worry about that as well. Yeah, I, and when the, the latest incident happened, I saw, you know, people demonstrating and saying, hey, my child or, or a, a mother herself said she had had uh, the condition. Uh, and so I think what you got to do is you got to try and get police to step back as soon as, as soon as you can, that this is not a law enforcement issue. It's an intervention issue. It's, it's getting the crisis response team. It's getting the resources. When we get back to how do we spend our money on which priorities? I'm fine sticking it back to Stewart on if he wants to say I'm anti-police. No, what I am is to help the police do what they should be doing, which is major criminal investigations, major issues, not uh, being put in a situation that they don't want to be in, nor are they qualified to be in. I think if you look at some of the uh, reforms that Mayor Mendenhall has put forward, she's been, I think, quite forward and, and effective on that. One of the areas that I I like and I like to think about is some of these civilian review boards are actually um, weak. They're not, and, and I think actually Salt Lake's not bad, but, but there are other models that are better where you actually do have a healthy uh, balance of police conduct and civilians, members of community that have real, a real ability to, to, to look at what needs to change or what didn't go right. Um, I think, you know, back to the uh, conversation I started with when uh, you know, Black Lives Matter met with the Fraternal Order of Police. Those conversations need to happen. Um, and they should happen, I think, under strong executive leadership. At the federal level, and I'll, I'll maybe answer it that way too, is that I think, of course, where does most of our money reside? In the federal printing presses. And so my argument would be that if our government could incentivize local police forces to build or to bring in capability that they don't have, nor should they be doing, that's money well spent. And that will probably take national resources from national tax dollars, not just dependent on local or state funding. But I don't think police should be, um, um, if they are aware that it's that kind of uh, situation, they should um, wait until the people who know how to handle it arrive, if, if at all possible. Almost every topic that we're going to bring up today is really weighty, really heartbreakingly weighty. Um, I wanna ask you if you can talk about something that's a bigger, maybe sometimes, sometimes a hopeful question. 
can you talk about your views on immigration, including DACA and Dreamers? I'm for a pathway to citizenship for Dreamers. There's been a couple of different pieces of legislation that uh, Chris Stewart voted one way and Ben McAdams voted the other way. And I'm, I'm on Ben's side of this, which is there should be a pathway to citizenship. You know, I, I was asked in the Hinckley, and I'll hopefully have another opportunity in about an hour to re-engage on it. Um, we, have, we have warped the strongest part of our story. It's a story of immigrants. It's a story of people from around the world seeing, seeing something better across that border. And instead what it's become is, is, is barriers and walls and drawbridges. And, and I think that there is a, a failure of Congress and it's not just the Republican party. I think that unfortunately with the dysfunction as great as it is, all of the hardest issues have been punted to use a cliche, but they've been punted for year after year after year. And you, know, you can extend that you know, immigration, you can extend it to COVID relief, Nothing's getting done on the most important issues in our country. Um, I've spent time in Honduras. I've spent time in Brazil. I've spent time across the border. And, you know, when you land in Tegucigalpa, what's the first thing you see from this very vertical landing? You see yellow school buses, the Thunderbird school buses. And there's this connection that was very personal when I saw that. And then you start to have conversations with people from Honduras and, it just guts me to hear that, you know, I've had some of my friends say, you know, you think we're all, you know, we're all less than human. And that's what we've got to fight against is what Donald Trump has given a third of our country, it seems permission to be, which is racist. And maybe it was there to begin with and now we know about it. Um, so I think it's, you know, as simple as when we're in conversations with our own friends and family, do we, say, I'm not going to let that comment go. I'm going to stand up and say, we're better than that. These are not subhumans. These are people that are looking for a better future and a better life. Um, you know, and in the other part of my book, and again, you've got me on my book today, I, I talk about, you know, being at the, the top of the World Trade Center. Maybe it's on my mind because it's not long after 9-11. And, and looking down at the Statue of Liberty, Well, okay, we're um, on that subject. And that's, and that's pretty tough to think about given, you know, what, what the Statue of Liberty traditionally has meant, you know. Um, yeah, sorry to interrupt. That's no, okay. Since we're on the topic of the divisiveness, um, one of the most serious questions I've seen come up, a question that's been on my mind quite a bit as well, Kara Lee asks, what do we do when protests turn into civil war? That trajectory seems to be going, the trajectory seems to be going that direction. Yeah, and Kara Lee, I, you know, I, um, I'm paid to be, I was paid to be a realist in my former job in the State Department, you know, neither too optimistic or too pessimistic. I always used to say that and then people would steal it from me, but I'm, I'm a realist by nature. I'm a fact-based, you know, let's call it like we see it. And and that's also um, what we're trying to do in this race, which is, you know, I look at what my opponent's doing and he's continuing to try and light the fire. He's continuing to try and want to redefine patriotism as a narrow exclusionary uh, definition. And again, this op-ed I wrote with John Zacchio reminded everyone about when our country went through that period with McCarthyism. It's, it's like drinking poison for all of us. And so, Carly, I, I sure hope that between November 3rd and January 20th, you know, that, that we're somewhat de-escalating. Um, I don't know if the odds are 50-50 or what, um, but I think it's going to take some luck and I think it's going to take a lot of work um, for some Americans to say this will go that way if we don't, if we each in our own way don't don't prevent it. And you were down in, in our meeting uh, in Kane County in Kanab when we sat down with Mike Noel, and you know better than anyone how he said he had his guns and his sons. Um, so why we're, why we're fighting Chris Stewart as hard as we are, it's for the right reasons. It, why we're trying to get this Trump chapter as much as possible behind us is because of that. Once again, fabric starts to tear, we know how quickly it can tear. I'll end with this though. I think that 60, a majority of our country are not, are not that. 
are not wanting that the minority or the well-armed subset that it would be willing to do that i think are still um less than the other people who don't um but i think it's going to take some luck and i think it's going to take all of us voting and rebuking um the status quo right now yeah and i think law enfor law enforcement that um you know, isn't militarized. And that's a topic we didn't have a chance to get into is what's been happening in terms of sort of the mili militaristic equipping um, tone demeanor of some of our law enforcement. And I think that's gonna take strong leadership and congressional uh, probably changes in terms of what is sent where and who funds it. Well, why don't you take a couple of minutes, two minutes to talk about that and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, so, you know, I was asked early on when um, the demonstration started, you know, what I thought. And, you know, when I looked at some of the streets locally, but also nationally, um, you know, there were like Humvees in Salt Lake City, you know. And I said, I'd spent enough time as a civilian State Department guy in Fallujah. I know what, what a real combat zone is, and we don't need the battle rattle. Um, and these quasi-governmental um, security forces, whether it's through DHS, uh, like stormtroopers. And some of these programs predate Trump. I mean, we have to be clear about that, but it's the oper oper operationalization of them, I think, that, that's taken a whole different level. Um, so what do we do? I think, you know, you basically start to say, it's not okay. You know, we don't need to have uh, stormtroopers on the streets of American cities. And if the equipment was transferred with some goals in mind, it hasn't worked out. Um, I'll end with sort of, you know, kind of the, maybe the more hopeful side of the topic today is, is that I think sometimes when you're forced to kind of take a stand on tough issues, you know where you stand. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are on a lot of the issues that we're dealing with in this general category is where are we on um, brutalization? Where are we on police reform? Where are we on uh, LGBTQ rights? Where are we on um, the public and private or religious spheres in our country? What is the right balance? And then finally, what are we going to settle for? Are we going to settle for uh, a divider in chief? Are we going to settle for facilitators like Chris Stewart, who on the most important issues in our country seem to come up with excuses to look the other way? You know, that, that's on us. You know, it's on us as maybe Democrats to give people a choice. It's on us as people who are concerned. And, you know, I'll, I'll make the final pitch. You know, I, these lunches are to also make sure we've got pennies in the piggy bank to keep on making our case. So if you believe in a candidate like me and a great team that we've got, and We've got a lot of volunteers that hopefully will be out in Twilla on Saturday making the case there. Um, it's an investment. You know, now is not the time to find reasons to step back uh, because by November 2nd, uh, we each will have our own report card um, and we'll know what that report card is based on what we did do or what we didn't do. And I'll, I'll end with thanking uh, some of you on the call today who um, you know, are writers yourselves. I probably spent too much time reading my own book, but. I've been very, really uh, honored to read what is coming into the uh, letters to the editor or into public commentary, because it's brave to put your name on, on paragraphs. Um, it's easy to talk and maybe tweet about it, but it's different when you, know, you say, this is where I stand and here's my John and Jane Hancock below it. And so thank you for doing that. And I would encourage all of you um to not be silent you know and, and maybe social media is not the only place to, to speak up i i think there's ways in conversations informally with our friends and family to say um we need to get past this chapter how are we going to get there what are the solutions are we listening to each other if we're not let's start did anyone have a final question Shane, did you have anything to add? No, Julie's going to wrap up now. Okay. I think it's me. Hi, I'm Julie Bartell. I'm the communications director for Weston for Congress. And I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, next week's policy lunch, Kale will talk about jobs and the economy, which is one of the top concerns we hear about from voters. He understands that it's going to take real reform and big people first ideas if we're going to survive the economic devastation 
and address the income inequality that's plagued our country even before COVID. He believes that we as a country have ample resources to bring hope and security to American families. It's just a matter of priorities and will. So we hope you'll bring your questions and join us next week to talk about solutions. You can register through the link you'll receive after this event. And we just want to thank you all for joining us today. Thanks. Thank, thank you all. And apologies for being a writer who read too much from his book. But, but uh, thank you again for joining us for our fifth policy lunch. And we look forward to our, our final two. And the election day is seven, less than seven weeks away. So let's make every day count, as we say. <laughs>